Okay, um, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth panel in today's programme, which is on the theme of sport, recreation and leisure. Uh, my name is Barbara McCormack, and I'm the librarian here at the Royal Irish Academy, having started in early April 2020 during the first COVID lockdown. I'm delighted to be able to chair this session today and to welcome our next four speakers, Dr. Sean Croisson and Dr. Marcus Free, Dr. Sandra Collins and Sylvia Thompson. Today, we heard how the arts and humanities provided an answer to isolation for many of us during COVID lockdowns. We will now explore how our leisure activities changed at this time and how in many ways we looked to sport, reading and outdoor exercise like sea swimming as an antidote to the loneliness and anxiety that many of us felt during lockdown. Our first speakers, Dr. Sean Crosson of University College Galway and Dr. Marcus Free of Mary Immaculate College, have conducted a significant study on the Irish media's response to the impact of COVID-19 on Gaelic games in Ireland during the first lockdown, particularly from the 12th of March when initial restrictions were announced to the 10th of May when RTE's The Sunday Game returned to our screens. Their research has identified several key themes arising from the media coverage of the time. Firstly, the emphasis on retrospective footage of past players and games, which filled the void created by the absence of live fixtures. Secondly, the impact of COVID and the, on the GAA and athletes. And thirdly, the role of the GAA in responding to the crisis, largely through the Club Together initiative, which many of you will have heard of, which gave much needed support to the elderly and vulnerable members of society that's over 5,000 people in the first six weeks of COVID restrictions alone. Their research highlights the relevance of the GAA to every part of Irish society during the pandemic, whether that was the players, administrators, volunteers, supporters or their respective families, all against a backdrop of financial uncertainty in the absence of fixtures and associated loss of commercial income. I'll now hand over to our first two speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you to Diane and to the Culture and Heritage Working Group, isn't that correct, for your invitation to myself and Marcus to contribute to this event. And uh, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here today and to contribute among so many really fascinating papers that we've heard already. Um, <clears throat> the COVID-19 virus in physiological terms is an attack on the human body, exploiting weaknesses in its defenses. It also effectively attacked the body politic in virtually every national context, achieving maximum damage in those countries, India, Brazil, the US under Trump, the UK, where the most toxic combination of neoliberalism and nationalist populism held sway. In Ireland, the weaknesses of the body politic were exposed <clears throat> Um, in February 2020 general election, when shortcomings in health and housing provision contributed to an outcome in, in which the centre-right Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael uh, suffered significant losses, but nonetheless agreed an unprecedented coalition with the Greens. Feared about, fears about the health services inadequacy informed a series of lockdowns uh, that followed the initial introduction of COVID-19 restrictions, lockdowns that were longer than in most other European countries. Despite such obvious mistakes in how the Irish government handled the crisis as the premature December 2020 reopening that greatly fueled uh, the significant increase in both COVID-19 infections and related deaths, it's generally more cautious than other, took a generally more cautious approach than other governments. Nonetheless, the virus acted as an exposing force, uh, as Irish Times journalist Una Mullally uh, described it, with regard to the failures of the hegemonic neoliberal model, including healthcare, evident in a depleted system following decades of eliminating so-called excess capacity and immigration. This was apparent in the cramped living and or working conditions of immigrant populations, including migrant workers in meat processing factories and asylum seekers housed in appalling direct provision facilities. The body politic in Ireland has been imbricated since independence with the Gaelic Athletic Association. Pre-independence, the, the masculine body of the Gaelic athlete 
as personified in this in this figure of the hurly, hurling playing protagonist Matt Donovan from Charles Kickham's highly popular 19th century novel uh, Knock Nagao, was eulogized as a model for national regeneration. And since independence, the imbrication of the body politic and athletic body, particularly regarding male players of Gaelic games, has continued. This is evident in the ongoing commemoration, for example, of Michael Hogan, the county Tipperary Gaelic footballer, whose death during the Bloody Sunday and the Bloody Sunday attack more, more generally by British forces on Crow Park in 2020, uh, something we'll return to in, in Marx's section of today's paper, was a key moment in the War of Independence. Uh, a further example is, of course, the, uh, the former Taoiseach, Jack Lynch, also uh, somebody who came to prominence nationally as a medal winner for Cork hurling team. Um, there is probably no European equivalent of a leader whose social and political capital originates in an amateur game that eclipses professional alternatives as a key locus for the construction of national identity. Much like national politics, the pandemic was an exposing force for both the uniqueness and strength of Gaelic games in Ireland and their perhaps related vulnerabilities. Drawing on methods in critical discourse analysis, uh, we've identified eight thematic strands and patterns of dialogical engagement within clusters of selected national and local print, broadcast and related social media threads at key moments in the unfolding crisis for the GEA and its participants. The period covered, as Barbara uh, mentioned, spans from March the 12th to December 19, 2020, the date of the All-Ireland Gaelic Football Final. For those who may be interested in reading further on the research, it's been published here, as you can see in the slide, in two books. Uh, and a third article is, for, is under review at the moment that I've uh, co-written with Maeve Nicole, which looks at an aspect we're going to touch upon today, but is equally in, important and perhaps one of the more once interesting aspects is the way in which women's sport in particular uh, was pr uh, disproportionately affected during the pandemic uh, in Ireland. So the first team we identified uh, focuses on the rhetoric of collective overcoming in Irish media. On May the 9th, 2020, anticipating the return of national broadcasters, RTE's flagship, uh, the Sunday Game programme, now largely a classics replay show in the absence of live sport, the broadcaster released a promotional video. It featured crowd shots, such as those on the slide, celebratory uh, moments, and scenes of actions of legendary figures from GEA's history. Book ended by images of gated pitches and uh, empty streets uh, and stadiums. It concluded, this too shall pass. The much quoted originally Pers Persian adage captured both the enormity of the crisis uh, in Ireland and globally, and also the promise of a return to a key element in Irish life. The promo video emphasised the GA's role in defining social identity, particularly through people's association with local areas and counties. Uh, Waterford hurler John Milan tearfully says, quote, I love my county. The passion and commitment involved was also emphasised with Gaelic Games commentator Marty Morrissey remarking, this is spiritual, this is emotional, this is about pride. And equally, uh, a stress was placed on the employment of these sports in a narrative focused on overcoming, evident in, in the slide uh, showing. You'll also note in these images how the GEA ground is visualised as central to Irish rural and urban with regard to its major stadium, Crow Park, landscape and community. Relatedly, in a second theme, print and broadcast media emphasised GEA members' contribution as workers in frontline services and community volunteerism and involvement in charitable activities, entailing a combination of intense individual physical activities and virtual collective connection. Through March 2020, as further restrictions were introduced, most media commentary regarding the GEA focused on its members' uh, community activities. When the Irish Examiner began a corona, uh, coronavirus solidarity diary, unsurprisingly, GEA members were prominent through April and May. And this is just one example of that. 
A similar discourse was evident more generally uh, throughout the media, such that Michael Kelly in the Irish Independent was, quote, inspired by the stories of GA clubs working together with local parishes to check in on people who live alone, make arrangements for meals on wheels, or just offer a few words of encouragement or concern over the telephone. GA members' community contributions eventually prompted the then GA President John Horan and General Secretary Tom Ryan to issue an open letter to all members commending their, quote, light, uh, by the way, a metaphor that we'll return to uh, shortly again, and a standard for the people who they represent. The GA ultimately is all about people, people working together for a goal, end quote. However, in a third strand uh, in this media discourse, there was a tension uh, apparent between this optimistic, future-orientated rhetoric and evidence of the horrendous financial impact on the, on the GEA, given its national specificity, lack of a governing international body with financial reserves, and principal reliance on ticket sales, uh, the, uh, and the potential outcome of moving more matches away from free-to-air terrestrial towards subscription and pay, pay TV. By the way, this potential outcome is one that I'm sure some of you will be aware is currently very much in the media and is currently is being realised to, to a certain degree. More matches are now available to stream, for example, this season with this considerable disquiet expressed, including by Tanish to Michal Martin, regarding the high proportion restricted to the GART subscription service, GAA Go. Despite the absence of player wages, the pandemic revealed the GA's financial exposure in 2020. It was more dependent on gate receipts for its funding than other sports, given its primarily national uh, nature and consequently limited broadcast rights revenue. The presently head headlined silence and stagnation um, st stock clubs in cold storage, Dermot Crowe's late March Sunday Independent article examined the experience of representative GA clubs. Crow also stressed their centrality to rural Irish communities, quoting a Donegal club chair, quote, the GA club is the heart and soul of the parish. It has been hopping recently and it just all came to a standstill. You eat, sleep and drink the club and what is going on in it. All that is taken away from you now. Everything is so negative at the minute, end quote. The Kerryman newspaper outlined a huge financial impact for Kerry GA, uh, approximately 6.1 million based on uh, 2019 income, and not just through lost gate receipts. It noted that, quote, many sponsors might be even closed down at the present time, hotels and the like. Are they in a position to carry on with sponsorship? Who knows? The financial impact manifested also in GA staff pay cuts in April and again in May. The Irish Times reported, quote, steep reductions ranging from 15 to 40 percent. Um, GA President John Horan forecast an overall loss of 50 million euro, alluding to the lack of financial reserves as profits are annually invested in development. Like its members, frontline workers and volunteer contributions to a collective national effort, Equally, the GEA's financial struggles were metonymic of struggles faced more broadly across Irish society. The pa pandemic further exposed, as evident in a fourth thematic strand within the media discourse, tensions between the GEA's so-called runaway train, elite, quasi-professional inter-county level, despite its official amateur status, and the local club level. A tension partly resolved through the revised club Intercounty schedule announced and followed through in, in autumn of 2020. This tension mounted as a debate developed in late spring con concerning how Gaelic games would return. Club games would generally uh, have generally been eclipsed historically by the extensively televised and increasingly glamorous intercounty competitions. Partly inspired by the exemplary role of club volunteers in the crisis, calls for club competition to resume prior to the inter-county competitions followed uh, tensions that arose early in 2020 when General Secretary Tom uh, Ryan stated that sp spending nearly 30 million on elite inter-county team preparations from the total association gate receipts 
36 million in 2019 was neither, quote, sustainable nor desirable. The metaphor of uh, runaway train uh, for this expenditure and its ex exasperation uh, of a county club divide, divide was widely used before and during the lockdown. These tensions were to some degree allayed when a plan was for club competitions to resume in advance of the inter-county schedule was finally announced in June 2020. Indeed, moving towards a split season model that separated club and inter-county competitions would increase streaming of games and national coverage of club competitions was generally deemed successful in end of year media commentaries thus affirming the GEA's local rootedness despite the usually higher media profile of inter-county competitions. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the only double act of the day, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take over at this point. Uh, nonetheless, this very local rootedness became a source of scandal following undisciplined post-match celebrations when club competitions resumed. On July 10th, the GAA announced that supporters could return to Gaelic games at a much reduced capacity. Concerns were expressed regarding the return to play for an amateur organisation, including by GAA historian Paul Rouse on News Talk. He said, the GAA has presented itself as a community-based organisation. It does not run itself in the professional context like the major leagues of European sport and of American sport who create essential bubbles to protect sports people. This puts the GAA in a very vulnerable position because if the coronavirus gets into clubs, it will spread across the community. The local club's enmeshment with every sphere of Irish society, so extensively lauded for facilitating voluntary and charitable activities in the spring, was identified here as a threat. And as apparently spontaneous local celebrations in early October of club victories became minor scandals, the GAA's local embeddedness presented additional challenges. In contrasting media discourses, local commentary, keen to defend the association and its members, diverged from national and international media outlets that linked club celebrations with rising COVID-19 infections. The question of what the games are for once spectatorless club competitions resumed and crowds gathered outside grounds was highlighted in local media. The logic of holding competitions was arguably compromised by keeping spectators out. In this front page of Cavan newspaper, the Anglo Celt, hope I've got the pronunciation correct there, Sean, uh, you'll observe an interesting twist on the genre of rural GAA pitch image we saw earlier. The emphasis on excluded spectators gathering anyway, and arguably less safely than if accommodated inside the ground, visually conveys the combination of libertarian individual rights arguments and local populism at play in some regional Irish media, despite the scandals over club celebrations. However, the organization regained any compromised cultural status through A, the Bloody Sunday Centenary Commemoration in November 2020, and B, the rescheduled elite inter-county championships with the administrators and players as exemplary proponents of safe behavior during the pandemic. At a time when celebrities globally lost much of their legitimacy due to their disconnection from ordinary citizens' lives, GA athletes fared well because of their location throughout Irish society. As the senior inter-county Gaelic football, hurling and camogie final stages con concluded in December, there was general agreement that the GAA's reputation was redeemed. Hence, Dara McManus's self-acknowledged hyperbolic claim in the Irish Independent that the GAA is, quote, a gift that's not just for Christmas, unquote, dismissing all criti criticism from pinched, pinch-faced doomsayers. Not for the first time, he said, the GAA has swooped in superhero style and saved this nation lifting us from the slow despond caused by COVID-19. RTE's broadcast of the quasi-religious commemoration in Croke Park of the 14 killed on Bloody Sunday in 1920, including footballer Michael Hogan, lent some legitimacy to the autumn inter-county championships staging. The torchlighting commemorative ceremony resonated also with efforts to commemorate the dead of the pandemic in separate national shine light events. No event could convey more poignantly the imbrication of the GAA and Irish cultural nationalism in the body politic. Another key factor was the GAA uh, senior administrators and players' promotion of government messaging. Following the All-Ireland hurling final, then GAA president, John Horan, appealed during the cup ceremony to all supporters to celebrate this victory in a sensible manner and not tarnish the work of these great players. Winning Limerick hurling captain, Declan Hannan, 
praised the frontline staff who've worked so tirelessly during this, this pandemic, acknowledging that, quote, businesses have been closed, people have lost their jobs, and loved ones have passed away this year who would really love to be here. He pleaded with supporters to respect the guidelines and enjoy this evening at home, unquote. None of the Cups returned to winning counties to avoid a focal point for gathering. Players sacrificing celebration following victory and exhorting supporters to do likewise exemplify the modelling and embodiment of an idealised Irish sporting habitus with which the GEA is inextricably associated, given its dependency on voluntary labour, community rootedness and players with day jobs in every sector of society. The inter-county championships thus ultimately involved a series of staged performances of national inclusivity. However, the foregrounding of the men's inter-county championships in the autumn television schedules implicitly reproduced Gaelic Games' gendered hierarchy. The pandemic uh, impacted disproportionately on women's Gaelic Games, thus replicating an international pattern in sport. Both the Ladies' Gaelic Football Association and the Camogie Association are separate organisations dependent on the GAA for temporarily providing playing and training facilities. There were several reported incidents of women's games being entirely cancelled or rescheduled, sometimes with very short notice. A further issue um, in the media discourse was the absence of any financial support, such as expenses payments for female players, unlike their male counterparts. Significant coverage eventually led to limited expenses payments to female players from October 2020, though with no future guarantees. Indeed, the Gaelic Players Association report State of Play, published in April this year, revealed that only 9.5% of women players receive travel expenses, with 6% of these getting less than 20 cent per mile. Male intercounty players receive 70 cent per mile. It should be noted, however, that as an exposing force of inequalities within Gaelic games, the pandemic did expedite important changes that may yet help to address ongoing issues experienced by female Gaelic games players. The Irish government has significantly increased funding made available to women's sports as a result. In July 2021, Minister of State for Sport Jack Chambers announced €4 million Euro for the Sport Ireland Women in Sport programme, which funds women's sports in Ireland, a 33% increase on the 2019 allocation. This funding increased further in the 2023 budget, which announced an overall record €52 million Euro, uh, funding package dedicated to sport in Ireland, including, quote, a number of initiatives aimed at improving the profile and visibility of female athletes across all sports with specific support for women in football and women in rugby programmes, unquote. Furthermore, to address the gender inequality in Gaelic Games, significant moves have been made to amalgamate the LGFA and Camogie Association with the GAA, thereby ensuring entitlement to equality of status for all athletes, including access to facilities regardless of gender. In December 2020, the Gaelic Players Association and Women's uh, Gaelic Players Association agreed to merge. This was followed in March 2022, by the Ladies' Gaelic Football Association Congress vote in favour of integrating with the GAA and Camogie Association. A process is now ongoing to facilitate this merger with former Irish President Mary McAleese as independent chairperson of the integration process between the three groups. A final issue that emerged in June 2020, but which we do not have time to consider fully, followed the Black Lives Matter protests triggered by the police murder of George Floyd in the US. This was the extent of racism in Irish sport and society, including Gaelic games. In the extended hiatus of the first COVID lockdown, broadcast schedules and print media addressed this issue in various ways in response to athletes from migrant backgrounds, use of social media to highlight their experience. For example, former Dublin Gaelic footballer Jason Sherlock joined Westmead's uh, Liberian-born Boyd Isaya on RT's flagship The Sunday Game programme. Uh, in Sherlock's case, recalling experiences of racism about which he had been largely silent during his playing career. The continued naming of many GEA clubs after 19th century Irish revolutionary, but notorious racist John Mitchell, was another topic of discussion. Both the gender and race issues illustrate additional dimensions of how the pandemic acted as an exposing force in the GAA, Irish sport and society. GAA stories became media stories, but in ways that are distinct from other sports because GAA players and volunteers are amateurs interconnected with every sphere of Irish society. Yet, while some contentious matters were advanced, the club inter-county championship tensions, uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, potentially resolved, the GAA media interplay highlights the role of Gaelic Games in promoting optimistic images of national unity and endurance. The off-site cliche that it is in our DNA is a metaphor that promotes the idea of national essence, 
and is usually expressed as a literal statement of fact. There is a tension nonetheless between the celebratory tone of much GA coverage during the pandemic, the gift that's not just for Christmas, and the endurance of unresolved issues exposed at that time. Despite positive initiatives ex expedited by the pandemic, women's Gaelic games are still poor relations of the GAA, and much work needs to be done to ensure equality of access to funding and facilities for male and female players. The Mitchell clubs have retained their names. And as journalist Philip Lang Langan, uh, Lan Lanigan pointed out in 2020, the fear gale, the true manly gale of the GAA's official guide mission statement, is still in tension with such laudable GAA initiatives as the inclusive Where We All Belong campaign. While the September 2020 RTE television documentary, New Gales, uh, celebrated African and Asian-born players in the GEA, the logic was that they were model migrants who had fitted into Middle Ireland to our national thing. Gaelic games and GEA media are a phenomenon whose internal tensions and perhaps contradictory currents were indeed exposed and probed by the pandemic. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, um, so thank you to Sean and Marcus uh, for such a comprehensive insight into the impact of COVID on Gaelic games. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of time for questions and comments at the end of this session. But for now, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sandra Collins, who's the University Librarian at University College Dublin. Sandra is Chair of the Consortium of National and University Libraries, a member of the Board of Governors and Guardians of the National Gallery of Ireland, a member of the Irish government's expert advisory group on commemorations, a board member of HEANET, and a council member of the International Research Data Alliance. Today, she will speak on the topic of books, reading, and the impact of COVID on libraries. Um, I'd just say, as a librarian, I was heartened, apologies, sorry, I was heartened to see the innovative and dynamic response of libraries to the pandemic, whether that was through collecting the Irish experience, or creating new and innovative ways to deliver services to a country in lockdown. For instance, academic libraries put practical measures in place, such as click and collect and digitization on demand to ensure access to the academic community. Public libraries introduced virtual story times, workshops and cocooning book deliveries, while other libraries, such as those in the Irish prison, prison service, purchased additional books to cater for increased demand from inmates largely due to the loss of physical visits. The library as a repository of knowledge can be seen in the provision of publications, data sets and other material to healthcare professionals, many of which were made freely available thanks to the removal of licensing restrictions by publishers. Those working in libraries, though, often returned to the workplace before the introduction of vaccines in an environment of fear and uncertainty around potential transmission of the virus from both people and objects. Many of us might remember the story of a burnt novel returned to Dunleary Rathdown Libraries by, I would think, a very conscientious borrower who reportedly thought that microwaving a book was an effective sanitation technique. Um, although this is an extreme example, it speaks to the fear at that time, shared by both custodians and the general public. This beautiful room, for instance, became a quarantine area for library material when we, we reopened in August 2020. So any books, pencils, weights or book supports that were in contact with readers were stored in airtight plastic containers for 72 hours. Back then, it was difficult to imagine a return to in-person events, which is why it's great to see so many of you here today. I will now hand over to Dr. Collins, who will speak about the impact of the pandemic on books, reading and the library. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Diane, thank you so much for the invitation to speak. This has been a really, really fascinating event, particularly in the breath of it. It's just been really um, thought provoking. And thank you, Barbara. I think you've taken half the good lines of my talk, so I'm going to do my best. <laughs> Um, so my pandemic experience um, started um, in the National Library and finished in UCD Library. Um, when COVID started, I was the director of the National Library of Ireland. And early in 2022, um, I became the uh, university librarian in UCD. 
Um, as Barbara mentioned, I'm also the chair of Connell, um, a member of LAI and so on. And my colleagues have been wonderful with um, sharing data with me. So I'm going to try to present the position across the breadth of libraries while recognising um, they really provide different services to different constituencies. But we have more in common than different. Um, so I want to talk first about the impact on the physical space from COVID-19. So libraries reopened promptly um, after the initial uh, shutdown of COVID-19. I remember standing in the front hall of the National Library welcoming staff back in June of 2020, um, and uh, which of course I wouldn't do very lately after that as the guidance changed. The guidance at the time, the public health guidance, had no reference to masks. And I remember one of our staff members came in wearing a mask and reminds me what Luke said. I was worried that I wanted to create an environment where people could wear masks if they wanted to and that they wouldn't feel stigmatised. And it's strange to look back and remember this because it changed so rapidly after that. Um, in UCD, the situation was similar. The library was one of the first um, services or buildings to reopen on campus. And again, as Barbara said, that was really in an atmosphere of unknown um, and uncertainty with regard to the number of users, the public health guidance, and trying to put safety measures that gave us compliance with the public health guidance that kept our staff safe and our users safe as well. The UCD library, after after reopening first and staying open throughout the um, pandemic was um, acknowledged later by University um, Value in Actions Award, which I think was really important to um, recognise that kind of frontier work. I don't think we were ever classified as frontline workers, but I will say I had COVID four times, so I did often feel like a frontline worker. <laughs> Okay, so let's, I mean, trying to remember, um, so Barbara has painted a picture of, of um, manuscripts and books being encased here for 72 hours before being transported and shared with readers and researchers. So having to rethink all the fundamental operations of the library and turn them into contactless service delivery, bringing in sanitiz sanitization and signage, and particularly the different um, social distancing, the physical distancing guidelines and the really dramatic impact that had on libraries. Um, so I might think talk a little bit about the visitor numbers, the, the throughput through the um, libraries. So UCD um, uh, pre-COVID would have approximately 2 million visits per year. And that's largely um, students and researchers using the physical space and the stock within and the different services. During COVID, that reduced down at its lowest point to 10% of that constituency. And what I wanted to um, answer uh, because of uh, this conference, and I can only give you the information that we have to date, is has that changed? Is everybody back using the libraries again? So looking across the academic libraries and the national library as well, um, those figures look like going from 100% pre-COVID Everybody dipping down to about 10% during COVID physical attendance um, in the buildings and now steady growth back, but not return to pre-COVID figures. So attendance at the moment, I would say, is in the order of um, 70%, maybe up to 85% um, across the um, academic and research libraries. And um, what does that mean? I suppose we have to wait and see a little bit more, I think. The public libraries as well, um, uh, their figures aren't released for 2022, but um, they could tell me that they've doubled um, their physical um, visits since 2021 and their aim is to return to pre-pandemic figures over the next couple of years. So definitely working in the building, it feels very busy and it feels like there's a real sense of renewal and energy of users um, uh, using the space and being very happy to be back. But it's interesting to see that the numbers haven't quite returned. Now, I'll say something about the impact on um, of physical distancing, and this gives me my first picture, which I thought book lovers in the room might enjoy. Um, so as you introduce a two metre distance um, in, for example, um, a, a busy academic library, that um, tremendously reduces the capacity of the building to serve the student body. 
So a consequence of that, of implementing that two metre distancing in the UCD library is a wonderful um, uh, positive outcome, which is an investment in the building to refurbish it because as the capacity reduced with the physical distancing um, uh, restrictions, um, the building became more important, less students could enter. And I think it raised the um, awareness of the services and the spaces, the importance of the physical physical space of the library. So we're the wonderful um, recipient of a capital development project, which um, is a great gift, but also um you can see uh, what we are in the middle of doing at the moment is um, moving all the physical stock, all the books and journals across the building because we remain open during the building work. So everything shuffles up and down across the floors as the builders come in. And this is some of the um, six or seven hundred thousand items that we'll be moving over the next year. OK, so I wanted to talk about e-books. Um, this is um, Hamlet by Maggie O'Farrell. Um, I think maybe it was my favourite book of the pandemic. It was published just as the pandemic um, began, but um, it's a fictionalised story um, of the death of ha um, Shakespeare's son from the plague. So a little bit meta there. I loved it so much. And um, that's a picture from my Kindle. And that's I bought the, um, uh, the hardback. I loved it so much as well. So a question to ask, I think, on the impact of COVID on libraries is, does it make a difference to borrowing? And the answer is it does really dramatically. Um, so um, I have all the bar charts, um, uh, but I will spare you them. But what the evidence shows, um, uh, certainly from the um, UCD uh, borrowing picture, is that borrowing reduced to 10% of physical stock, I should say, the actual book um, uh, resource, the print book, um, it reduced by 90%, so down to 10% borrowing during COVID and it hasn't returned. So I think that's really interesting. So over the last year, the borrowing of physical books is still only at 10%. Um, the purchasing of resources of print and ebooks. Um, there was a lot of financial support from the government, from the university, um, uh, particularly to the public libraries as well, to purchase e resources because they were really essential during COVID when people couldn't reach the print um, edition. Public libraries saw an e-lending increase of 280%. That maps to what we saw in the academic libraries as well. Um, and I think, I suppose, the, what the public libraries wanted to stress was that it's really important that people still borrow print books because e-books are not um, a direct, they're not an equivalent. Um, they are a different experience. One I enjoy myself, as you see from my Kindle picture, but particularly for different age groups groups and different demographics, it's really important we get people back borrowing the physical stock as well. So some examples that the public libraries were doing were a little library, um, a free book bag um, for every child starting primary school and um, uh, the, the, the book bags that they would deliver through the community um, for um, uh, different library users. OK, so if ebooks are definitely on the rise, and I might add that's not the case with your personal consumption. So you as a citizen wanting to read, you still buy more print books than you buy ebooks. This is really a library phenomena and the borrowing of books. So let's have a little think about is that good or bad? So um, I think ebook usage is a really valuable resource and a wonderful thing to be able to share, um, particularly with students. So they use less on-site storage, which releases space that we can provide to students for studying and working collaboratively. Um, they have less of an impact on the environment. Um, they, um, in the cost of living crisis, students don't have to come to the building to borrow them. So there's a lot of reasons why they're positive. They can have additional functionality and um, searching and um, more accessibility, accessibility tools um, that make it easier for um, uh, people to engage with. But is it all good? It is not all good, as you can imagine. So when a library um, buys an e-book or an e-resource, they don't buy it under the same terms and conditions that you might in your personal use of an e-book on a suitable device, your laptop or a Kindle. 
So three, I would flag the three main issues for ebooks are exorbitant pricing. So the price of a one user ebook license can be up to 1,400% more than the copy of the print book. It's horrific. So we see numbers um, ranging between 200% to 1,400%, even up to 20,000 euro to purchase one ebook. They also have limited availability. So in 2019, only 10% of books were available as ebooks. So you can't, even if you had the budget to buy them all um, or license them all, they aren't all available. They also have very restrictive licensing. So they're generally, libraries generally don't buy them and purchase them and own them. They license them and then through that license, extend them to our borrowers. And important high use textbooks are often locked into bundles, which forces libraries to buy books that we don't need. We know our users won't use, but they're part of the financial package. You also get something called exploding licenses, which takes the book away like that. It's gone. And that, the fragility of that really showed up in um, uh, August 22, when Wiley, um, one of our large academic publishers, um, uh, made to remove 1,300 ebooks on short notice. And these were ebooks and textbooks that um, the university had built into their teaching. Students are using as resources and it wasn't possible. The plan was to remove them without an alternative resource. And that would have been extremely um, detrimental to the learning experience. So um, the students, this is a lovely um, uh, picture, um, uh, it was picked up in um, media. The students, the librarians, the researchers, the academics um, raised a kind of a campaign behind ebook SOS to point out the, um, the um, unfairness of this model. And um, something that really concerned us at the time was that Wiley wanted to move to a business model that charged the cost of the resources would depend on the number of students using the resource, so class sizes and so on. Incredibly intrusive, way beyond your, your, your rights to know of a business model. So very disturbing look ahead. But having said that, this is how people want to borrow their resources from the um, research libraries. So what can we do? Are there alternatives to locking into expensive licensing models with academic publishers? A possible alternative is controlled digital lending, but no Irish um, library has taken the risk of implementing control, controlled digital library lending. So as a concept, this is that when as a library can buy a print book, we can loan it, that you would um, extend that same model to the digitized, the digitization of the print model. So that means that you would have a book in the library, which you're allowed to loan to um, as many users as want to use it. And you digitize it and now you provide it online. And that avenue looks very weak at the moment this year. So in the last uh, two or three months, um, an American American um, court, federal court, has ruled that the Internet Archive may not provide that service. So the Internet Archive um, preserves websites and also collects and digitizes a really, really, it's a not-for-profit organization, a broad range of material which it then provides access to online. Um, they took uh, books which were in copyright, ran, digitized them and provide controlled digital lending. And during the pandemic, they provided the access to more than one user at a time. And that led a number of big publishers, HarperCollins, Wiley and Penguin, to sue the Internet Archive for a mass breach of copyright. And that case has been successful. And in ruling on that case, the judge also cast out over controlled digital lending as well. So I suppose it's a... Um, a problem that we are grappling with. And I think it needs a look at policy and business model um, uh, behind that. 
Okay, so I wanted to say um, something about the enduring value of the physical experience and the importance of our unique and distinct materials. So if libraries are moving to ebook provision for textbooks and journals, which I think we are, and that's what people want, people, our researchers still want access to the physical objects. This is um, an 11th century um, vellum um, uh, book from the Franciscan collections in UCD that we care for in UCD. Throughout the pandemic, um, our special collections, our archives, our heritage um, library organisations digitised and um, provided material, digital surrogates to researchers across the world. And that's really valuable and very expert and complex work um, carried out. Um, but um, I think in the end, the figures show that what researchers want is to experience, the, to be in the presence of the object, to have that physical physical experience as well. And looking at our numbers, our visitors are coming back into the special collections reading rooms. I'd also say briefly something really important um, that the special collections and the unique materials that libraries and archives collect, that we need to do that for the COVID experience. So it's been very interesting um, uh, having this reflection now, but even as we talked about different experiences we all had, one kilometre, two kilometre, five kilometre, and um, that was um, very rapidly changing public health guidance. So something we did in the National Library at the time was to archive archive all the public health guidance websites and there's a record there now of what you could do at each time if you were um, uh, uh, compliant with your public health guidelines and many other things. I love this idea of the time capsule. Um, uh, David McCullough said RT News Today paused for a bit but then they came back and they ran a competition for children to um, capture the COVID experience in a drawing or a painting and they gave that archive to the National library. So there's wonderful resources, but just to say how important it is. So I want to finish by um, just reflecting on the um, the library's role in public engagement, programming and exhibitions. I love this photo. Um, we launched just a few months ago, um, Heaney and the Classics um, uh, um, exhibition in UCD. And I think that photo, that's uh, Mary Heaney, Shane Heaney's wife and Joe Hassett, the curator of the exhibition. It shows you cannot get that online, that look of this is a joy to be here. It is a wonderful experience. And I think that's really important um, thing that libraries and, co and heritage and uh, cultural institutions provide. So Gillian talked about this as well, and I really love that you mentioned the Shane Massini exhibition, because while that was happening, that, that they were a fabulous, fabulous team in the National Library um, and very innovative in moving online. But I was always worried, what will happen when we reopen the library? And now we have to do all the things that we do in person, and we have to do all the fabulous things that people love online. And there's still only that team, like they didn't double themselves. So I think we've passed through this and really reached a kind of a balance between the online and the physical experience. But I think they're both really important and they bring different things. And I suppose just a, a moment to pause and uh, reflect on the, the funding and the personnel and the innovation and creativity um, that's needed to do both those suites. Numbers and um, the National Library in moving online, so including Seamus Heaney and all the other um, online initiatives, saw a growth from its online interactions from 20 million pre-COVID to 30 million during COVID. So I was really interested to see what that looks like now. And I got onto the team and um, the figures for 2022 look like it is coming back down to pre-COVID levels. So it's a bit early to say, but I think it does reflect a transition from the online experience back to the physical experience while noting the numbers back on site are not quite there. So we're probably in a position of flux. Um, the cultural institutions, so I knew the National Gallery welcomed more figures in the last year than they did pre-COVID. So that's a really buoyant return as well. Um, and 
I guess um, the something that the public libraries were very keen to stress there is that the numbers are not the answer. So a lot of the services that li- libraries provide are public good services. They're about bringing people together and um, uh, they certainly have a concern that their constituency, including vulnerable users or people who may still be cocooning or worrying about their health, younger or older users, that are we making enough efforts to get those people back in the building so they can experience all the benefits. So I'll finish by saying, and um, this is a um, lovely quote here. I love it. Um, it's from Eileen Morrissey, um, the president of the Library Association of Ireland and the county librarian in County Wexford. I feel very strongly about this, that library collections, digital and physical, are absolutely vitally important. They're the cornerstone of the library, but so too are the connections that people make by physically using and being present in the free and democratic library space. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Sandra. And it's a, it is a great quote, I think, to end your, your talk on. Um, and just the idea, I suppose, of people um, and people coming into the libraries, but also, again, the staff and the personnel um, throughout the pandemic that, that kept services going is so important and I think really came out to that talk as well. Okay, um, so I think we can agree that one of the most positive things to emerge from the COVID restrictions was the re-engagement with our physical environment. And I know we've heard much about this earlier. Um, The idea of slowing down and getting back to nature. So this resulted in huge increases in outdoor leisure pursuits like sea swimming, which offered physical exercise and potential improvements to the immune system, while helping people deal with the impact of lockdown on their mental health. Open wash swimming became more important following the closure of swimming pools and gyms around the country. So I'd now like to invite our last speaker, Sylvia Thompson, to discuss sea swimming and the reconnection with nature in the context of the pandemic. Sylvia Thompson is an author and journalist who writes on health, the environment and science for the Irish Times. Sylvia has an honours degree in psychology from Trinity College Dublin and a graduate diploma in journalism from Dublin City University. She won the Medical Journalist of the Year in 2005 and the Global Lung Cancer Coalition Award in 2019. Her books include Hands On, The Art of Crafting in Ireland and Test Driving Complementary Therapies. A keen walker and sea swimmer herself, uh, she lives in Greystones, County Wicklow with her husband, artist Des Fox and their children. So I'd just like to, to invite Sylvia now to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like um, suggesting you all stand up or move. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's an unenviable position to be the last uh, speaker, but we'll give it a go. So um, I think what I'm going to do is engage you more with my personal story about how I took up sea swimming during the pandemic and the multiple benefits of that. But first, a little bit of context. One of the unexpected and very welcome phenomena of geographical restrictions during the pandemic was how people reconnected with their local areas, which has already been mentioned a little bit. Everyone witnessed how families with working from home, which actually hasn't been um, discussed uh, today at all, people working from home had extra time saved from commuting, how they were able to go for walks and cycles in their local areas, rediscover local walks, local heritage sites, which which was also mentioned, um, that had often previously been taken for granted. Um, My Irish Times colleague Hugh Linehan wrote a fascinating piece early on in the pandemic when we were restricted to two kilometres, and this captured the mood of discovery. Aimlessly walking within two kilometres of his North Dublin home, he asked, am I a flaneur now? referring to the French term for an urban wanderer. In his piece, he indulged readers with a myriad discovering uh, discoveries on his urban promenades. I'm just going to read you a little piece. You can uh, find it in the Irish Times archives if, if, if you want to. 
this is what he said. Many of us have excavated from childhood memory the fact that the circumference of a circle with a radius of two kilometers is 12.57 kilometers. That's the outer limit of the area prescribed by the state for my exercise during the current lockdown. Thanks to 2kmfromhome.com, I know the line runs from the mid 20th century suburbs of Colester and Donnycarney through the red brick streets of Drumcondra and Glasnevin via the under new ownership ecclesiastical lands and industrial yards of the Tolkien Basin to the Dockland housing of East Wall and to the Victoriana of the Clontarf seafront. So it just gives you a kind of a, a, an example of the extent of his local area. To navigate the actual circumference would require crampons, wire cutters, and swimming togs. But with the aid of my trusty phone, I've set 12.5 km as my minimum walking distance every day. The experience has been rather wonderful, due in part to the good weather. We all remember how May 2020 was particularly nice, but also to the richness of the man-made landscape scape through which I move. I thought I knew this neighborhood, but I was wrong. The place is full of quirky shortcuts, black back lanes, and miniature architectural curiosities. I found myself going down more than a few dead ends, which does, don't really matter when you're keeping coronavirus hours, but also have become more aware of the pernicious fashion in suburban design of the last 30 years for single entrance estates and gated developments, the enemy of the random wanderer. The routes vary every day, but inevitably I find myself tracing and retracing the same paths over the course of a week. There's always something new to notice. A derelict warehouse with unusual detailing off Richmond Road or a lovely little wildflower park near Collins Avenue. And there is always more to discover in the aesthetic detailing of this apparently banal, but actually deeply textured built landscape. So that's Hugh Lennon's piece about am I a flaneur now, which the rest of it is, is worth reading as well. The interest in exploring local so-called blue spaces, which are lakes, rivers, coastal spots, and green spaces, which are defined as parks, woodlands, and forests, predates the pandemic. There have been several research studies exploring the benefits of spending time in nature, with the University of Galway leading the way in many of these. In the few years preceding the COVID-19 pandemic, I wrote quite a few pieces on everything from forest bathing to mindfulness in nature workshops, woodland walks for your mental health and ecotherapy. The ancient Japanese tradition of forest bathing, Shinri-yoku, was revised in the 1980s as a therapy for stress-related diseases. Since then, Japanese and South Korean governments have developed forest therapy centers where people can go and spend time appreciating nature. There is now a network of forest bathing guides in Ireland who lead these mindful walks at various locations across the country. The Woodlands for Health project, which was first launched in 2012, offers weekly walks in nature for people using mental health services. And there's a growing number of social prescribers who following a prescription from your GP will suggest various social and recreational activities in your local area. In his beautifully written memoir, Nature Cure, English broadcaster and writer Richard Maybe described how he conquered clinical depression through his reawakened love of nature. According to Maybe, the idea of a nature cure goes back as far as written history. The Roman term solviter ambulando describes how you can work out your physical and emotional issues by walking. 
Maybe's personal experience was that rather than nature taking him out of himself, it was nature seeping into him, firing up his imagination that helped him, that helped bring him back to health. But coming back to the theme of today's event, I wrote a piece, um, I think it was 20, March 21, when we were, the media was already anticipating the end of, pan, of the pandemic before, of course, it ended. So this piece was called 60 New, 16 New Ideas for Post-Pandemic Ireland. And one of these ideas was from Irish Wildlife Trust campaign officer, Porrick Fogarty. And he argued that the confinement to our local areas during the pandemic sharpened the focus on places where people didn't have access to natural areas. And in his, his idea was he called for the right for everyone to have ex access to wild natural places within five kilometers of their homes. And so to see swimming which became such a well-documented phenomenon of the COVID-19 pandemic, as people sought a solutory escape from the foreboding feeling of the global infection. All along the Irish coastline, small groups of swimmers met for daily, twice weekly or weekly ritual of cold water immersion. For some, it was always a quick dip in and out. For others, it was about chatting with friends while treading water. But then some people actually did some sea swimming, becoming fitter in an effort to protect themselves against serious illness. Jokes about dry robes became a mantra among those observing the sea swimming phenomenon. And some veteran sea swimmers put up notices in popular spots such as the 40 foot and Sandy Cove, no dry robes here to mock the newcomers. As my husband often says, how do you recognize a sea swimmer? They'll tell you about it. And I must confess that although I don't have one of those snazzy zip up dry robes that you sometimes peep, peep, see people wearing in the supermarket and, and um, around the streets, I do possess a poncho towel dry robe, which makes getting dressed quickly after being in the sea so much easier. In her recent book, Ebb and Flow, surfer and marine social scientist Eski Britton quotes Katrina Lynch, founder of a program that introduces adults to sea swimming in Galway Bay. She said that she had never seen so many people in the sea as she did during the summer of 2020. It was powerful. People really needed the sea. They were desperate for it. People who always do it needed it. People who never did it before needed it. They needed the sea the water, that sense of community, doing something together, and it gave them so much. In her book, Britain writes that the pan-European blue health research concluded that water environments are the most restorative of all. Research has found that blue spaces, outdoor bodies of water, are associated with a lower risk of depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders, as well as greater relaxation in adults and improved behavioral development and social connection in children. People who have recently been bereaved have also spoken about how sea swimming can jolt them back into feeling more normal, less broken. London-based sea swimmer Lisa Buckingham wrote how as her body went into survival mode and her mind couldn't focus on anything else, she could have a few blissful minutes of not having to think about loss. As I climbed out, the endorphins kicked in and my shredded nervous system bathed in the feel-good hormones at a time when nothing else felt good, she wrote. And while there was a great surge of interest in sea swimming during the pandemic, much of which has continued, the interest in the therapeutic benefits of being by the sea and immersing yourself in cold water dates back to Victorian times. Then it was seen as a perfect antidote to urban living. In January 23, historic garden and landscape historian Vandra Costello gave a very interesting talk to the Irish Georgian Society on how seaside resorts began to develop in the mid-18th century. 
She talked about the then new interest in sea bathing and the restorative powers of seawater and the development of villas and baths along the Dublin coastline and Cork as well. And so to my personal story of discovering the joys of sea swimming. I grew up in the Midlands with a mother who never learned how to swim and a father who taught himself to swim in the deep ponds of a local river. I was never one of the bravest or boldest swimmers at school swimming lessons. So having become a sea swimmer is a bit of a revelation to me. Just about 12 years ago, um, we, myself and my family came to live in Greystones, which was a move kind of prompted more by my husband's desire to be back in his native Wicklow and a choice of a nearby school for one of our daughters. The sea on the doorstep became the added bonus. But like many others, it was only when the pandemic hit that I really took to sea swimming all year round. In March 2020, I needed something to give my mind and body an escape from the bombardment of information about the pandemic and began getting in the sea at, at a time when I later discovered it was the absolute coldest time of the year to do so. Many people swim right through to December, but avoid January, February and March as the water temperatures plummet to single digits. For me, sea swimming has several strands to it. First, there's the challenge of doing something that has an element of fear involved. Every time you plunge into the cold water of the Irish Sea, you're a little bit scared, but there are a series of impulses that make you do it again and again. Getting ready is important. I put on my swimsuit before I leave the house. I pack my bag meticulously, towel, goggles, swim hats, usually two, sometimes three, and boots in the winter months and cycle to one of the local swimming spots where I know other people will be at a specified time. The sun might or might not be shining, but it's never raining or very windy when I venture out. Swimming with others is hugely significant. First, there is the communal assessment of the water. Is it choppy, calm, tied in, tied out, or somewhere in between? Then there's the unspoken anticipation of the shock of the water in the first few minutes, followed by the sense of achievement, later sometimes followed by a sheer bliss of being enveloped by the water, moving in a synchronized way with your breath, arms and legs, if the water is calm, or just making do, bobbing up and down with the waves if it's not. And then knowing when to get out, when you've had enough, or in fact, just before you've had enough, so that you get out safely and enjoy the afterglow. And yes, it's this afterglow that drives us all back in every time. Fellow swimmers at the South Beach and Greystones readily admit to being addicted to the exhilarating feeling that they have after swimming in the cool, cold, or sometimes almost freezing waters of the Irish Sea. The physiological explanation for this sense of exhilaration is that the cold water forces the blood to rush inwardly to protect the body's organs. And then when you get out, the blood rushes back out to the extremities and is this experience that transmits positive vibes to the brain. I have heard scary stories from some swimmers about what it's like for the body to go into cold shock in the water, a feeling that is almost sleep-like but is in fact the first stages of hypothermia, not something you ever want to experience. The key to enjoying sea swimming is never to let yourself change your mind about getting into the water once the conditions are safe to do so. Once you decide to go in, you just have to do it. Not that you need to dry, dive in. In fact, walking slowly in, wetting your shoulders if you like, is better so your body can adjust to the temperature slowly. Sharing the repetition of the daily or weekly or twice weekly swim with others is almost spiritual. The chat is easy. Often the same conversations are had again and again about how it was when you were last down and the cheery wave goodbye until the next time. Occasionally, people share some personal details of their lives, but more often than not, the camaraderie of being there is enough. Another aspect of sea swimming that melts into other parts of your life is how you look at the sea. Psychologists call this soft focus. 
You can simply be looking to see where the tide marks are on the shoreline or observing where, whether the waves are choppy or gentle. And this observation or soft focus gives the brain time off from other more demanding activity. It's a kind of balm for the mind and probably explains why so many people go on holidays to the seaside. If you are one of those whose work is primarily involved in brain activities, calculating, analyzing, making connections and drawing conclusions, this soft focus is a welcome break. The reward is that your head feels clearer, sharper afterwards, and sometimes solutions you've struggled to find come gently to the surface of your mind. And then there are the other health benefits, that satisfying physical feeling of tiredness that helps you sleep better, the fresh sea air that keeps colds and flus at bay, at least some of the time, and the aches and pains that are temporarily dulled by the cold water. What more would you want? Physical exhilaration, mental time out, and social connection. But there's another gift that sea swimming gives those who enjoy observing their surroundings. It's the glimpse of a cormorant drying its expanded wings after its catch has been eaten. It's watching the rare sight of a great black-backed gull sweeping across the sky or spotting a starfish underwater when the sea is clear or having the ultimate seaweed bath when swimming after the storms have brought in vast quantities of slippery kelp to the shoreline. Thank you. Um, thank you. So um, I'd just like to thank our four speakers today for a very interesting discussion on COVID and sport, recreation and leisure. Um, just a reminder that we will have closing remarks from the Academy's Executive Director, Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan, following questions. Um, but we do have about, oh, I think we've got about 20 minutes or so um, for questions and comments. Um, so I'll now open up to the floor. Yes, Luke. This is just Sandra. I mean, as an advocate for open science and open access, I have to comment that the only reason online lending is so expensive is because of the, frankly, criminal and rapacious conduct of certain commercial publishers and an antiquated copyright law which has been weaponized by big media companies. There is absolutely no justification whatsoever for that level of price gouging. I completely agree. So I think um, what we would like to see in Ireland is not more funding to purchase e-resources e for users of libraries. What we would like to see is um, a policy position and a domination of the business model. I mean, it's um, it's a tricky one because they very, very entrenched model. And of course, as um, academics and researchers, um, we, uh, we are participating participants in the system. It's it's a complex one to change, I think, but it is imperative because this is public funding um, being privatised. We're the mediators of a service that um, it, it really feels like um, price gouging. I agree. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's not just that the commercial publishers are charging exorbitant amounts for something that should, in any rational economic system, be much cheaper than a paper copy. Yes. It's also that they are now actually infringing seriously on the privacy and pri privacy rights of um, academics. They track who reads what. And this is really very worrying because they are also selling that data to um, anyone who's prepared to pay money. And you can certainly imagine certain uh, governments being very interested in who is reading Karl Marx, who is studying certain questions about certain products. It, it's a serious infringement of academic freedom, actually. So uh, these are things that we need to take very seriously. 
Yes, agreed. I, I took great heart um, last year when the um, reading community, so the researchers and faculty and the students came together with the librarians to raise the profile of the ebook SOS campaign, which saw Wiley reverse their position to delete the 1,300 ebooks. So I felt like this was a turning point, but time has passed since and... Um, uh, I suppose the 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 leg copyright law needs a major review here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, yep, Dan. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for for that session. Just a, a quick a bibliographical note for for Sylvia. That it was it was partly connected with uh, because she was in Ireland recently. There's a member of the Académie Française Chantal Thomas who has written a, a journal de nage. Her her swimming dur during the pandemic and now she was doing it in nice which is a little bit more uh, comfortable <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a lovely book it's probably in the nature of things unlikely ever to be translated but it's just a really lovely book and she was in ireland recently at an ria event here uh, connected with the michel deon chantal thomas thomas yeah but that's really a lovely book and she actually read it from another book in Kurch uh, in galway in the literary festival so uh yeah, she's an interesting figure. But I wanted to ask, a, or maybe a comment or question for for <clears throat> for Sean and Marcus. It was, it was such a great topic, and your presentations were really very helpful in thinking about this question. It made me think of so many different episodes, partly of Cheltenham and the reluctance to you know shut down <laughs> before Cheltenham. The, the, you know, which the loss of life I think is pretty pretty clear, which happened as a result. But I was thinking also about, um, Marcus, you referred to it, to the kind of pitch invasion moments. And okay, one could look at them as this is dreadful and to be condemned and so on. For me, I, their excess was an indication of that desire for joy that people and transcendence. I mean, I don't want to get too romantic about it, but I, I think they were excessive because people had been denied experience of transcendence and joy. They were irresponsible and they shouldn't have happened and so forth. But there's something is very meaningful about this as a social practice, as an anthropological practice, uh, that, that, is, that I think you, you, you're, the work that you're doing is quite important trying to capture that. So thank you. Um, thank you, Dan. Any other questions or comments? Uh, uh, could, could I just oh, res sorry, apologies, <laughs> sorry. respond to Dan there? Yeah, it's kind of a, a, a running theme, I think, really, uh, over the course of the day from the very first uh, David's uh, first presentation uh, the, this, this, this morning. Uh, of course, at the time, uh, I, I wasn't, I think, uh, widely known that it was it was safer to to gather outdoors. Uh, you know, so there was still these these fears about, about spreading the the, uh, uh, the virus. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of um, you know, kind of. Uh, condemnation, particularly on social media, of, of those spontaneous uh, uh, celebrations. But um, you know, uh, it, it is after after such a long a long delay, and and uh, so so it was uh, in, in retrospect uh, um, uh, un understandable, and and you know we we know uh, that you know outdoor gathering is is, is safer than indoor gathering. Um, so uh, you know, I suppose that that kind of aspect. That sort of darker aspect of the GAA's history in 2020 is probably uh, kind of largely forgotten at this stage. But I think it's just another uh, point um, too is, is to do with the. Um, I suppose it's the, the, the uh, which again kind of relates to, to other things that have come up over the course of the day. Uh, the uh, the kind of the interplay, like in Patrick's presentation, there the the interplay between uh, you know theater and, and television. Television, you know, uh, live performance on television, and the and then live performances outdoors, you know. The, so there was this kind of, uh, you know, fascinating sort of interplay. This this kind of this thing that 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 uh, 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 television does that 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 you know uh, forms of kind of uh, drama on television don't do and film don't do. You know, the, the kind of the the sense of liveness, the sense of of, of sort of communality, and of course, uh, you know, this was denied uh, to GEA and other support uh, supporters for for uh, for several months, um, and uh, so that kind of yearning for uh, togetherness with which uh, uh, David talked about there with the the. Uh, 
um, the need to kind of mark the passing, uh, to 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 see the body, to 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 uh, uh, to collectively mark somebody's passing. Um, uh, that, that that that's 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 something that 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 uh, I think uh, um, you know is is is, is quite quite understandable and, and I suppose it just as, as well I was just really struck by the the way in which the um, uh, the swimming and the the uh, the library presentations there they, they came together there was, you know, it's wonderful actually to be able to uh, be in a room full of books uh, <laughs> so as, as, as a lecturer I I, I I agree entirely with with uh, Luke's Luke's comment there and it's just appalling uh, you know the the uh, yeah, speaks volumes, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, about the uh, the motives of, of these commercial academic publishers. They're doubly parasitic on the on higher education. They feed off uh, labour, which is is funded uh, by universities as employers, and uh, and then they rip off universities uh, with these uh, e ebook policies. Uh, but yeah, the libraries libraries are social spaces. The the uh, the chance encounter uh, with books that. You know, you you won't come up in your search. Uh, chance of encounters with people uh, in in libraries, their social spaces, and and uh, holding a book in your hand is a very sensuous thing. And uh, as is, you know, the the uh, the experience of sea swimming and, and walking and cycling, all of these things that uh, that we did a lot of um, within limits uh, during the, during the lockdown. Okay, sorry. Um, so, would anyone else on the panel like to contribute to that or to comment on any of the of the points that are made um, there? No. Uh, yeah, I know there's someone at the back there, but if you want to go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a question for um, Sandra. I was wondering, is there any data on the genre of books that people were downloading or reading on the e-books? Um, just wondering, was there an increased interest? Um, we mentioned earlier in period novels, maybe for that escapism, or was there an increased interest in Irish culture in the same way that there was with those outdoor theatre performances that we saw and um, film with On Colin Kuhn? So just as I did on that, thank you. Oh, it's a really good question and I don't know the answer, but um, I will see if I can get it because now you have said it, I would love to know. Um, thank you. Uh, so Diane, do you want to go ahead? So Sandra, I'm sorry, I'm going to come back to the, the same issue a little bit, but I, I, I think one of the things that's been latent in a lot of our discussions across the day has been the normalization of expanded screen culture and screen time for all of us. And I just wanted to come back to the issue of hard copy reading, because in terms of how I see my students using ebooks, I'm very worried. I mean, not all reading is the same. And I think a lot of e-reading, especially for students, is instrumental and superficial. And it amounts to quote hunting. You know, you told me I should read this book. Now I've proved to you that I've read this book. And, you know, in some cases, not usually university copies and things like this, but, um, you know, you've got what's available online at midnight or whatever is, is every other page, but that doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's a very distorted form of reading. And I guess I'm just wondering, and this could be a question, because I guess all of you and, and Sylvia in a, in a different way deal with aspects of print culture and e-books e and things like this. Is it maybe going to be an increasing priority going forward in education and other realms that we shelter students and others that we see this as, as something that really has to be dealt with, that, that the massive expansion of, of screen time and screen culture and e-ingestion of texts um, it, it is something, I mean, you already see it obviously in elite education, right? Where we're, we're young people and, and you know, are very carefully, um, you know, cosseted from too much screen time. So I guess one other part of the pandemic experience that we haven't lingered on that seems really important to me is, is the, the utter inability to critique how much time we spend with screens. Diane, I mean, I think this is the, the, there's a lot of work to do there. I think um, I know my phone tells me what percentage of my week I spend on the screen. And that was a disturbing figures over the course of COVID. So I think it's interesting for libraries because I what I sensed from um, talking to the different library directors across the sector was that the public libraries want to intervene to drive readers back to print and that's an inclusivity measure as well and it's something about age and demographics and so on so I think that's um, 
and, and the nature, I suppose, of public libraries as a meeting space for um, communities that might not otherwise be drawn together. So I think I, I think that's very positive, and I'm interested to see how they will do that over time and what it will look like. The figures are stark for their e-loaning um, during COVID, um, but it, it's it, 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 it's a cause correlation. It's it, it's hard to unpick it at the moment because if you couldn't access the physical materials and the government um, uh, made funding available to purchase e-books as a mitigation, that was a wonderful thing and people kept reading. But has it um, changed the Irish use? You know, post-pandemic, if our figures are that people are only borrowing in the academic libraries 10%, the, the, the print borrowing is down to 10%, is that... Um, so what does that mean? So a swing to digital during COVID was um, necessary and a mitigation. And did our users get used to that and they want to continue? And they, they're weighing up the pros and cons of it and the, the, the depth of learning, how deep it goes or if it's surface, all, all, all the factors you're talking about, but they're choosing to continue to work digitally. Um, so, but then we also provide more e resources Resources. So as a result of that pivot, we're maintaining our licenses for the materials that students are borrowing heavily. So we're um, influencing the path without, I think, taking a policy, you know, like um, stopping to think what is the right policy direction. And maybe that's, you know, maybe it is things like public health guidance and and. and bigger factors we should be um, considering there. Yeah, the world has changed. And I thought what I would see as I started asking people for data was that we were coming back to pre-COVID. And definitely it looks like that for people coming into libraries. And I feel it on the ground. Um, but the numbers don't bear up on the, the access to the, to the digital resources, which is not like, so just to say again, for all the readers in the room, um, you're still about, um, I think, 60% in favour of going to the bookshop and buying a print copy and in, enjoying the experience of having the book in your hand. So it's a different pattern for libraries. Yeah. I, um, just one last thought as well. I, um, we were just talking about this today. I, 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 I worry about, um, how artificial intelligence, intelligence will impact that as well. So some of the wonderful accessibility features of the ebooks and searching and, you know, um, if you're, um, for eyesight and so on, like there's wonderful features for it, but it does also open you up to, um, AI use. Give me a summary of the book give me an analysis of the and so on so it's um it's all to play for i would say hey um i think we've got time for maybe one more question and um, there's a lady there uh, want to wait for the microphone thank you very much um when i was listening to you to um the sport um talks i was thinking about you know the kind of connections that people make flippantly between sport being a religion um and one of the absences from today's discussion largely has been about religion other than the burial uh, and observance. Yet much of the language has been uh, kind of, trans you know, it's the language of transcendence and so on, is a language that um, possibly um, is, is in, in the place of religious experience. So the kind of language around sea swimming, for instance, is often, well, it's kind of a celebration of perhaps pagan experience qu quite often, but it seems to, it seems to have come to replace what might in the old, old days have been a kind of religious ex experience. And again, in terms of the GAA, I, I, th I thought particularly when I was watching and the film Lakeland, which I know you were talking about, Sean, was that the GAA had come to stand in for the church in terms of uh, the parish and, and in terms of authority. And I wondered if, you know, part of what we're, what we're looking for in COVID and, you know, seeing after COVID is the, re is the church being replaced by people in search of other kind of, um, if you like, spiritual experiences, not through uh, conventional religion. 
I'll just um, respond a little bit to that. I think um, the whole reconnection with the natural world has also happened a lot during COVID and since COVID. And I think, um, you know, the need to understand the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis is, is hugely linked to our understanding of being kind of interconnected with nature, which I suppose some of the dominant uh, religions actually saw us as having dominion over nature. So in a way, that's a kind of transformative kind of human understanding that's happened a little bit in parallel, maybe, to the decline of, of religious observance. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, the reconnection with nature is also in some way seeking some kind of uh, communion with with the natural world and they say that you can only protect what you love which I think in the whole context of understanding biodiversity it isn't a rational response that we need to both climate change and biodiversity it's an emotional response that that will actually work in the same way as theatre was mentioned earlier as a kind of an emotional engagement with the with the issues. Yeah, and just to pick up on, on that point, but also to think through how we understand religion and what religion is or has been as a, obviously a personal, but equally a social experience that provides meaning and understanding and social engagement. And of course, as we know, the decline of uh, religious observance and the kind of undermining of the status of the church is something that began well before COVID, but that sport has in increased in importance for people in providing that meaning and providing those opportunities for coming together. And that, and this connects back to what you were asking earlier, Dan, as well, you know, why did we have those moments of uh, pitch invasions and local gatherings? And I mean, it was, I think as much about ways of coming to terms with that trauma that provided social connection that religion would have done in, in, in previous time, uh, as it was about breaking or infringing. And I actually, <coughs> Mark has put up the front uh, page of the anglo Celt, the local paper from where I come from in, in Cavan. And I think the local press was really important during uh, the pandemic for charting, uh, I think, quite a different narrative than that we saw in the in the mainstream press. That's part of the reason why we did that kind of comparative study. Uh, and part of that narrative was capturing that kind of local communal uh, response and trauma and confusion and uh, an identity as well about how they could express the importance of sport and the importance of their community in a time of trauma and crisis. Hey, um, that's great. I think we're we're just okay for time now. If, did you want to make another comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no. Just to, uh, I suppose, um, maybe just make a reference to uh, Tom Inglis, the um, UCD historian, you know, a sociologist who, who's you know spoken about the rise of the of the term, you know, spirituality. You know, and he talks exactly about this that uh, you know. Uh, um, the uh, uh, sport and, and in large context, particularly the GA, has kind of taken over, you know, some of this role that, that the church had in, in, in Irish society. You know, for my cycles and, you know, uh, during lockdown, one thing I was struck by, by every tiny little village you'd come to, they had enormous church, you know, in, in Broadford, there's a massive church uh, in County Clare, just, it staggers me, just the ambition. It's not really that old. And um, I, my guess is it's largely empty. Um, but the GA pitch, which is, you know, despite migration eastwards, which is a big problem for the GA, it's probably doing still doing pretty well. And uh, so, you know, you, you have this kind of, uh, it's a sort of secular religion. Um, and, uh, and I think that the bloody Someday, you know, the the, uh, the that kind of memorial, you know, I think that tied in too, to to you know something that I wanted to ask David about this morning, the rise of of, of eulogies. You know, I, I think I, I don't know if they've been kind of fueled by streaming, you know, but funerals I've been to recently, the eulogies are a much bigger thing than it used to be. The last funeral I was at a few weeks ago, the eulogies came first, and the priest was sort of embarrassed about having to go through the motions with the Eucharist in in, in the second half, and uh, you know. They had an extra service for a comedian, but they weren't really needed. Uh, you know, he wasn't the star of the show. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so, 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 so the, it, it's, it, 
yeah, okay, I, I, I better shut up or I'll, I'll keep going and embarrass myself. So, okay. Um, okay, so before we hear from the Executive Director of the Academy, Dr. Um, Siobhan O'Sullivan, who's going to um, give some closing remarks, I'd just like to invite you all again to thank our four speakers for this panel. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so Sylvia need not have worried. She wasn't the last speaker of the day. That an enviable task uh, falls to me. But I'm going to be brief because it's been a long afternoon, um, but also because it's actually impossible to do the task Diane has um, uh, given me, which is to kind of give the summative remarks. So I won't even attempt to try and do that. And um, simply because of the breadth of what we've heard today, it is, um, it's been a fascinating day, um, you know, from death to, to nature, to film, to, to the GAA. I was, I'm very lucky. I'm an ardent Kerry supporter. So the one great thing for me was sitting my Dublin child down who plays for a Dublin club, watching all of the old matches. Um, and him understanding and that this too would pass was exactly what I was trying to tell him, that this too will pass, Dublin dominance, and we'd be back again. So there was a kind of, he did sort of understand that there was a time in my childhood where I went to matches and was astounded that Kerry lost anything. So, uh, so this was a good thing. Um, I think there were a couple of key things, key themes that struck me today actually. And that was this, the first one was this, the kind of relational element of our lives, this interconnectedness. That was something that was a kind of thread through everything we heard. Um, our interconnectedness with other living things, with other human beings, with nature, um, with our sense of selves. And the fact that COVID, I suppose, exposed or was an exposition of this interconnectedness and this vulnerability. Um, and then that kind of arose the, the issues of the importance of intimacy, of touch, um, of the fact so from, from saying goodbye to our loved ones, to holding a book in your hand, to being present with other people for a performance. Um, and that kind of then, to me, morphed into that whole discussion about how, of course, we all recognize that we all had very different experiences, but that there's a need for different voices, for diversity, um, that we need to draw on that diversity um, to inform, to have expertise. And I think that really, to me, means we need to construe expertise perhaps more broadly to embrace that kind of diversity. Um, I think there's the that brings us then nicely to that issue of trust and critical inquiry um, and that really being important for democratic legitimacy as we heard so we don't stray into that kind of auto autocracy the autocratic kind of uh, kind of inclinations we talked about earlier today and I think that was really interesting to me an idea that goes a kind of collaborative um, approach to trust and trustworthiness but I think we need to go again beyond even that, because as we heard this morning, the deficit there is we kind of have this passive exchange of knowledge from one person to another. When in fact, I think what we really need is challenge and critical inquiry. And I think back to Philip's point, not for divisiveness, not, not to create conflict, but actually to build understanding and common understandings. Um, and I think it was so interesting to hear earlier how art can play and literature can play an important part in this. It's not about soothing the soul always. It's about, it's about provocation and that the role that that can play. And I suppose we also have to, uh, another reflection, I was listening to people and I was saying, you know, the, the, the trauma that we've all experienced. But in fact, there's been a lot of innovative practices that have emerged We've seen change, change that perhaps we wouldn't have seen otherwise. Um, and of course, that's always the way with big kind of traumas, wars, pandemics, etc. They all initiate that kind of innovation. I think the trick here is to harness the best of that and to see that we can sustain that going forward. I think we've heard a lot today 
about time and timeliness and place. Um, and to me, I think it's about what was interesting to hear how the social sciences and the arts and heritage provided us with a kind of historical context in which we could understand this experience. Um, what we experienced individually, collectively, um, and actually as importantly as somebody said, to help us heal, to help us address that trauma going into the future. Um, we've heard about the dangers that we may enter into this kind of pandemic nostalgia. Um, that's true. Personally, I would fear that there is a danger of a collective amnesia, actually. And that was interesting seeing um, that's exactly what happened after the 1918 flu. I recently had a discussion with a WHO colleague of mine who said, we've learned nothing. So we had, if you go back to that literature um, and you see all of the lessons we could have learned and didn't learn, that that's a moral failure. And that's quite a strong statement. But I think we are in danger of committing a moral failure here not to learn from those lessons. Um, and that was what struck me when we talked about um, the lessons we need to learn are around inequality. We had a lot of discussion about that today, how that underpinned so many of the things that we saw during the COVID pandemic, about where you lived, what you could access, were you a part of arts, could you access that? Um, you know, all of those kind of issues. And then really struck, you know, by Jane, like by the discussions around, like, and I'm coming from an ethics background. So for me, values are, as Dan said, values are really important. So science taught us lots, but what values underpin that science? What values underpin those decisions? And it is too late to be having that discussion when you're watching pictures from Bergamo. It's just too late. So really to say that we should be having those discussions now so that we can have this broad, inclusive, diverse voices and we can decide as a population what's important to us and then we can strive to protect that. So thank you so much. I want to thank Diane. I want to thank the, the committee. It's been a wonderful, wonderful day. I think so we don't commit any moral failures. So we do have this discourse. I think today has been a really good example of how we can start that conversation. I'm delighted that we could have that discussion here in the Royal Irish Academy. That's what this place is for. And so to thank everybody involved, to thank all of our speakers, to thank the organizing committee, Diane, and the Academy staff for participating and, and making all of this possible. And, and just to say, I hope this is the start of a conversation and not the end. Thank you so much. <laughs>